about the assassination and uh, I want to know if you're uh, the people in uh, you live in Australia okay so uh, generally people how they feel or is it justified to them uh, to see such an assassination happen in uh, some part of the world and uh, are they okay with it or is it a, a big news or the media didn't cover it at, as much No, it is a big news and people, generally, honest people, are uh, disturbed and shocked by it. But the problem is we have a media here, which is very, the corporate media and to some extent the state media, which is very geared towards normalizing their, um, their wars and their, you know, their villains and their good guys and so on. So unfortunately, you know, the decent instincts of ordinary people are degraded by that type of media. I call it a colonial media or a war media that actually is always, um, you know, trying to create these fake images. For example, there's a very big polemic in the Australian media at the moment about China, that China has criticized, the government of China has criticized Australia for its war crimes in Afghanistan. And there was some cartoon that was uh, on Twitter and Uh, the Australian government has taken tremendous offence and now there's this huge offensive by the media to make out that China has done something terrible to Australia when all China was doing was pointing out the crimes that they had admitted that were carried out in its name in Afghanistan, you know. So there's a very um, toxic media um, run by private corporations who are controlled by the big companies that run the economy here. And linked to the US, and they keep distorting the reality of these sorts of events. And uh, what about the uh, necessity of Iran's retaliation? Do you think Iran need to retaliate out now at this point, or uh, if uh, Iran should, uh, what are the possible ways to do it? Yes, well, um, of course, Iranian officials have already said that they will, and. Uh, It's expected that they would because there has to be some sort of justice, uh, if it, even if it's retributory justice in this situation. The problem is um, the assassination, the murder was clearly a provocation uh, trying to incite Iran to do something. So that's why the timing and the nature of the retaliation are very important. And uh, also the, the, the idea of responsible Uh, actions is very important. That is to say, those who are going to take actions which carry risk and which put other people at risk have to be responsible for their actions. So in that in that sense, outside people can't say what should be done and when, uh, because when it is done, what it is done is very important. And I think only the most responsible people can decide that. But it can't go on forever. You can't allow impunity by these criminals who carry out, uh, well, first of all, they murdered uh, Haj Soleimani, a tremendous figure loved throughout the region. Now they're, they're, now they're, they're continuing with that program. And of course, um, the doctor, Dr. Mohsen was not the first uh, Iranian nuclear scientist to be murdered by Mossad, you know. So it can't go on forever. <clears throat> But how a response is carried out, I think that it's important that responsible people calculate that. Uh, what about waiting for Biden to come to administration and take the power? Uh, so the possibility of Iran getting back in JCPOA, also U.S. getting back in JCPOA, uh, would not be shattered. So uh, because that's a discussion here, some people, or uh, especially the Rouhani government, wants uh, uh, Iran to stay in JCPOA and NT in, uh, NPT. But uh, the uh, the other part of uh, government and people uh, wants to leave. What do you think about that? Is there any benefit for Iran at this point to stay and in, in that deal? Um, I, so I think you put two question, questions together. Then one was to do with waiting for the Biden administration. Um, I'm not sure that that is all important. Although it's certainly there are strong messages coming from the U.S. along those sorts of lines. Um, There is a different type of relationship that Iran faces with Biden, not really so much strategically as in terms of the language and the tactics and how they go about their aggression and how they go about trying to contain the influence of Iran in the region, because both sides of US politics uh, 
um, are agreed on that up to the point when they begin to redefine their role in the entire region because they know that they're losing in Iraq, in Syria, for example, but they continue with their destabilization and so on. Now, as regards Iran's politics, <clears throat> of course, it's true that there's a very you know, deep division really over the whole concept of the JCPOA. And <clears throat> I can just say, you know, as an outsider, my opinion that there really was nothing in it for Iran except to get rid of the sanctions. Um, but remember, when that began, this was a time when uh, Iran was facing in the Security Council, um, not just the US and the Europeans, but also Russia and China. So Iran was in a very difficult situation years back when this process began, and the aim was to get rid of the sanctions. We know that that didn't happen despite all the concessions that were made. But of course, things have moved on. There's no possibility that China and Russia are going to go back into that sort of situation again, um, the way things have gone. And the Europeans are stuck. They don't really know what to do because they can't, they haven't got the spine really to stand up to the Americans. And it and even, even their, I think it's called Instex, their financial mechanism to bypass SWIFT and the US dollar and so on. They haven't been able to invoke that because their companies are in fear of losing all the business with the Americans, you know. So in the longer term, we're looking at some other sort of financial arrangement, which are probably going to come through China, I suspect, and the virtual currency with China there, you know. So <clears throat> the JCPOA is a creature then, I would say, that has changed over time. You know, there was, um, it was something that Iran perhaps was forced to do some years ago, um, but it's changing very rapidly now. And uh, indeed, Iran has been adapting to that reality, including the murder of Dr. Mohsen, that there has now been, the parliament has initiated, I think, some changes with respect to the, the nuclear program and so on. The outside, you know, the enemy discussions are, well, I mean, this is all about the military program and so on. They carry on regardless, really, of anything that Iran does, because there is this, and maybe I'm anticipating your next question, there is this intense jealousy about the role of Iran in the entire region because Iran has supported the resistance in Palestine and in Lebanon and in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen, and so uh, apart from Iran itself. And so this is the underlying sort of mega uh, or great narrative, if you like, behind all of these all of these things. But the JCPA itself, I believe it is a creature that is changing with time. And I think it, at some, you know, Iran at the right time, and I come back to my point about responsible leadership, you know, those who will wear the consequences of what they do have to make these sorts of decisions. But I think uh, its utility to Iran is, is certainly diminishing. Uh, what about the NPT? The Nuclear Pro Proliferation Agreement, yes. you mean? Well, this is something that um, Iran has signed and Israel hasn't, for example. And so to that extent, there's this asymmetry in, in what's happened in the region. Um, you know, the, the problem with the JCPA was that it proceeded on an assumption that Iran was proceeding towards nuclear weapons and that there was some sort of legitimacy for unilateral disarmament of one country, which hadn't really occurred before. It was quite a unique sort of situation. It was a unique, um, you know, post-Cold War situation after the, the, the dismantling of the Soviet Union. So it, it, it's a very unusual and very unique situation. And once again, whether or not the Iran decides to I don't think there's really anything in it for Iran to withdraw from the nuclear prol proliferation agreement because uh, so far, you know, the leader has made it very clear that there is no ambition to seek nuclear weapons and, and the asymmetry would be better resolved by pressure on the Zionist entity to accept that same agreement. Um, that would seem to be the logic. Indeed, there was an attempt to do that, I think, um, more than a decade ago, maybe between 10, 15 years ago, and that failed, but it failed fairly narrowly. <clears throat> so it might be that diplomacy could resurrect that process to get Israel, which I believe is signed up to the International Atomic Energy Agency, but not to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to try and resolve that conflict there. That, that may still be a fruitful avenue of diplomacy. Yeah, sure. And uh, what about uh, Iran's role? Get back to that, please. Uh, in the region and, of course, uh, in the inter international uh, 
sense uh, and why uh, it uh, poses a threat to Israel that much? Well, I think we first have to understand what Israel is, basically, and Israel is effectively a colony of initially the British and then now the Americans, basically. It's a, one, it's a Zionist construction, it's a colony in Palestine, which has all those corrosive effects of a colony engaged in ethnic cleansing and so on. But it's really situated there as a tool, a strategic tool for the Americans, for the US Americans these days. Um, so they have a base to destabilize and to try and control the region. Now, given that Egypt took itself out of the picture back in 1970s, um, given that Turkey is you know, been a member of NATO for some time, these are the other two big countries in the region. Um, the significance of Iran, particularly since 1979, has become extremely important. One, because Iran has a very strong political will and a very, very clear commitment to uh, its own independence and the independence of its neighbouring states in the region. Um, and two, because it does practic practical things to help the resistance of the Palestinian people, the resistance of the Lebanese, particularly in the invasion of 2006. We know we've heard a lot about last year, including interviews with Hassan Nasrallah, interview with late Taj Soleimani about the role of Iran in helping Lebanon defend itself. We know the role of Soleimani in defending Syria across the whole of Syria, um, the role of defeating Daesh, the role of Soleimani with uh, uh, with Mohandas in Iraq and so on. So this is exactly why the US is so hostile to Iran, that it really is the core of the axis of resistance, as the expression goes, in the region. That, that is to say, the, the coalition of independent countries, the alliance of independent countries that do not want to be subjugated to an opposing coalition led by Israel and Saudi Arabia. And so Iran is at the core of that um, against the two servants of the US really. But I I mean, I know some people in the Middle East think that Israel controls the US. I, I've never believed that. Uh, you know, the, the, the Zionist tail does not wag the imperial dog, in my opinion. The big power has Israel. Of course, Israel has influence in the US, but um, it is really, uh, the master and it can decide to what extent it's going to uh, engage and support um, the Zionist entity there. So I think this is why um, Tel Aviv and to a fair degree Washington are obsessed with Tehran. They're, very, they're obsessed with Tehran. They know they can't overthrow it, but they can try and destabilize it and weaken it and attack it from uh, the outside send in groups of Dash or uh, MEK or any of their other assets, position those assets <clears throat> around the boundaries. And this has something to do with Afghanistan as well as Iraq, of course, too. You know, why is Dash now in Afghanistan um, creating conflict with uh, the Taliban? Whatever you think of the Taliban, they are at least an indigenous group there and they are in their own country defending their own country uh, and they now have to deal with um, with Daesh as well as the occupying powers there you know so but one of the reasons the US keeps uh, the destabilization of Afghanistan and Daesh there is precisely to surround Iran with assets which from time to time they can carry out terrorist acts and destabilize and uh, perhaps drive people to desperation in combination with the so-called sanctions which we should call unilateral coercive measures because really they are illegal economic siege measures applying to virtually the whole region now, um, you know, right across from uh, the siege in, siege in Palestine and Yemen, the destruction of the economy of Lebanon, of Syria, of, of, of Iraq as well. These are aggressive, illegal, criminal measures. And the obsession with Iran will continue until they decide that, and there is a faction within the US uh, oligarchy, which is saying this now, including people like the current Minister of Defence that Trump has, that uh, and his and his advisor, because these were people that supported withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, recognizing the new reality that they have lost in Syria, that they've lost in Iraq, and uh, their line is more or less along along these lines: let Erdogan deal with Iraq and try and. Uh, annex parts of Syria and Iraq, 
Erdogan can deal with that, he can pay for that, and we will create a new line on the top of Israel, Jordan, and across and, and, and redefine. In other words, a type of strategic retreat in the region, hoping that they can, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, encourage and incite their allies, which are really their subordinate, you know, allies like the Saudis, like Erdogan, like Israel, to carry on their own fight. Because as we know, in the US itself, there is a very deep crisis, a social crisis, an economic crisis now. And the more that goes on, the less likely uh, there will be support for adventurous new interventions and wars. So uh, will it be very di different between um, what Trump's doing and what Biden's going to do essentially between Democrat and uh, Republicans? I don't think in essence, but in tactics, yes. Uh, I mean, let's remember also the Trump, uh, for all of the ugly features of the Trump regime, including not least the um, encouragement of the annexation of uh, East Jerusalem and West Bank and the Syrian Jolan. Despite that, despite the aggression, uh, despite the murder of Soleimani, the murder of Dr. Mohsen, um, Trump had an argument to withdraw troops from Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan. And he failed in that. He was a weak president in that sense that he couldn't prevail over the deep state there. Now, Biden comes into that situation with a a more cooperative or collaborative relationship with the deep, deep state. So it depends really what's going on in terms of that type of consensus. We know that the liberal side of US politics has always tried to present a more human face to their atrocities, the, the, what they call smart power, that they will use, they won't do the, the, the George W. Bush invasions and the Donald Trump we'll steal the oil, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we're here to steal the oil. They won't be overt like that. They'll try and put nice language on it about supporting the human rights of the people of Iran and, and so on and so on, those sorts of things. Like the Obama regime did when they created ISIS and Jawad al-Nusra and the, the other terrorist groups there. And all of the evidence is out on that and very clear. But Biden has to face a new reality, really, that is how how is he going to deal with, how is the deep state, because Biden effectively is a figurehead as Trump was, basically. And it's, in some respects, Biden is a more compliant figurehead than Trump. Trump was always in conflict with his with, with the state. You know, there was this conflict and he was constantly firing people and so on. Now, now Biden uh, is a much more compliant figure. He's but he's already taken to the politics of um, image building. You know, here's all these women and these people of color, women of color, you know, the Kamala Harris and uh, Susan Rice and so on, which are all committed to, you know, supporting Israel every day. And you know, uh, their, their track record is not much worse than the ugly type of people that Trump hired from, you know, the, the Elliot Abrahams and what was his name? The the John Bolton, you know, the Yosemite Sam, those those sort of people, um, they will do it in a smoother way with with and the new Secretary of State, uh, what's his name, uh, Walken, something like that. Um, they will do. They will appear more sophisticated and smooth, and uh, but really their interests haven't changed very much until the time when they start to. Uh, a type of strategic withdrawal. By the way, we saw this in Asia after the Vietnam War. You know, there was this doctrine of withdrawing from mainland Asia back to the islands in Asia and so on. And that's now being spoken about within elements of the deep states to say, we'll, we'll pull back from Syria and Iraq and let Erdogan deal with that. And, you know, or the Saudis compete with, with and Erdogan who are themselves competing over carving slices out of Iraq, for example. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a big game here, which um, is also in a process of change, which was called the Grand Chessboard by Brzezinski, that uh, late uh, strategist from the US, where his idea was the big picture in the world was that the US was facing a great threat through the integration of Europe and Asia, which is the, the the, the human center of the world, really, from, from Europe to Asia and everything in between, including West Asia. Um, if there is a 
peaceable integration and normal business relationships, you know, like through the the Belt and China's Belt and Road and the um, Russia providing gas to Germany and all of those sorts of integration processes, a strong economic relationship between Iran uh, through the Caucasus to Russia and Iran and China, those sorts of things. Um, then where's the role for the US in Europe and the role for the US in Asia? It diminishes a lot and the US would tend to be marginalised back to its continent, basically. And this was the big challenge being faced. And Brzezinski, towards the end of his life, and he died just a few years ago, was saying, well, things have changed um, and we're not going to be able to prevent um, completely the, the integration between Europe and Asia. But um, there is still the question of, you know, the US having stakes in the ground. And of course, West Asia, you know, in the middle between East Asia and Europe is, and, and, and Eastern Europe also, where the US managed to block Russia from Europe through Poland and the Balkan states and the Ukraine and so on. Um, they have been the big playgrounds for the big power game, more or less. But will the US retreat to a certain point and say, we'll, we'll, we'll defend Israel in, in these terms? but we'll withdraw from Syria and Iraq and we'll let other people take over. Uh, I think that sort of strategic retreat is something that is being calculated in the background of, of the deep state in the US. And I don't really think Biden by himself um, will uh, lead that because I think he's too compliant. And remember, he's the oldest US president in history. We, we used to joke about Ronald Reagan in the 80s about how old he was. Reagan was younger when he finished his two terms than Biden will be when he starts his next term. So we're looking at President Kamala Harris probably, you know, in the next year or two, basically. And uh, what would be the uh, role of UN entities like Security Council and uh, uh, their relationship with the uh, Zionist and Deep State? and um, how they were formed and uh, what would they bring to the international uh, stage? We, you know, it, within the United Nations, there's a very deep division between the, the entities that are um, set up by the General Assembly, where the developing countries, the former colonies dominate, and the Security Council, where you've got three NATO members with a permanent veto on, on things there. Um, you know, the difference in recent years is that the role of Russia and China have become more independent and more assertive, but it's still not rarely possible to get in any agreement in the Security Council in terms of, uh, and, and the point of the Security Council was originally to prevent war. Now, clearly they haven't done that because what have we had? We've got a war in Palestine. We've got, um, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. We've got the invasion of Lebanon, you know, the, the invasion of uh, Libya and and Syria and the war on Yemen. They haven't been able to prevent any of those things. So the Security Council effectively is a dead letter when it comes to preventing war. Unless there were to be major reform in the UN, which admittedly countries like China would like to see, but uh, not happening in the short term. There, there is a role, I think, for the other agencies of the UN, although they are also sometimes co-opted by the big powers. But from time to time, we see for example, Israel and the US withdrawing from UNESCO, withdrawing from the Human Rights Council because they are unhappy with the fact that UNESCO and the Human Rights Council have been welcoming the Palestinian delegations into those into those entities. Or, you know, there's too much criticism of Israel for them, for example, there. So I think there's room to move. Uh, there's, there's a, a, a pred potentially productive struggle over UN agencies that are controlled by the General Assembly. But with the Security Council, it, it, it's much more difficult. Um, um, they haven't really carried out their function of preventing war. And so we can't have too much hopes there. We really have to look rather at um, countervailing powers. That is to say, you know, even if it was thought undesirable, but nevertheless, the, uh, in, in general, in principle, nevertheless, the role of Russia in West Asia has become very important because it's a balancing factor effectively. And it's very difficult for little countries to resist the big powers. Imagine even before Russia got directly involved, little Syria, a small country, resisted for four years. And the Europeans, the Americans, um, you know, Israel, the Saudis were all against them funding these outrageous Takfiri sectarian terrorist groups and so on. 
they resisted for a long time by themselves, but it was extremely difficult. Um, really, there has to be some bigger powers that play a countervailing role there, you know, and that, that means giving concessions like port facilities and, you know, other concessions and so on. But nevertheless, I think in the current circumstances, we can't really see the Security Council preventing war. So we have to look at those sorts of coalitions that are made with um, some of the outside powers and China, which has been more reluctant to get involved, but certainly they would um, they have an interest in infrastructure. They've done a very big deal with Iran and um, their role in helping, for example, the the integration of the region in infrastructure. You know, there, there have been this project around for a long time of um, road, rail and internet links between Tehran and Beirut, for example, all of these and the Mediterranean, those sorts of projects, uh, regional integration projects, the role of China, I think, is an important way. China and Russia are important ones there. So that countervailing power is needed, I think, because of the failure of the UN um, agencies, particularly the Security Council.